Okay, today I'm at Lingfield with uh, Kevin Blake. Thanks very much for agreeing to talk to us today, Kevin. Um, right, for people that don't know, can you tell us what you do? Um, I suppose very quickly, as quickly as I can. I'm, I'd probably self-identify as a journalist broadcaster. Um, I work with ITV, Sky Sports Racing, at theraces.com. Um, I have a, kind of wear a few other hats as well. Um, I do a good bit of work for Joseph O'Brien in, in a race planning capacity. I, um, I breed horses at home. Um, I, do, I do a few different things. I don't like to um, confine myself too much. <laughs> and uh, home, obviously, by your accent is in Ireland. Um, can you tell us how did it all start? You've, you've sort of got to a, lot, a high place in a relatively short period of time. Um, yeah, it, it's a small bit of a random story, really. I've no background in racing at all. Um, both of my parents would have come from farming backgrounds, but would have, wouldn't have known anything about horses at all, really. Um, where I live, like I'm kind of in the, the heartland of it, really. You know, I live 10 minutes from Bally Doyle. You know, Tommy Stack is two minutes up the road, but sure, racing is, is a bit like that, isn't it? If you, if, if you don't know, you don't know. So I was, I was kind of blissfully unaware of it for a long time. And uh, my father decided to buy a mare off a fella in a pub for 500 quid one night, despite knowing absolutely nothing about it. One of those impulse decisions and uh, threw her out in the field and tried to learn a bit about it. And I kind of started to take notice then. And when I hit 15 or 16, it, the, the, the puzzle aspect of it started to really grab me. Um, and like, I, I've got a kind of a mind, like I, I find it hard to concentrate on things I'm not into. So school was a bit very, a case of two halves for me. Like what I liked, I, I really liked and what I didn't like, I really struggled at. But racing really grabbed me at that age and you know from you know 15 16 17 i really struggled to concentrate at school because i was so into racing and i kind of knew quite quickly that it was something i'd like to try and make my living in and after that it was just a case of trying to figure out how i'd do that so what aspect of racing was it that grabbed you initially um, i suppose like a lot of people it's probably the puzzle the betting puzzle you know being in the area i was you'd, you'd have plenty of people in your social circle would have a bet on the grand national and things like that and just the notion that you could go down to go down to this shop, have a few quid on a horse, and come back out with, with ten times as much as you went in with is quite intriguing. And then, of course, you go deeper into the sport, and you realise just how deep it is for someone that with a with an analytical mind. You, you know, you realise that once you dive in, like there's no real bottom to the pool, and that was really attractive to me. You know, so once once I got into it, I just kept swimming and kept swimming, and you know, as everyone. Watching this probably knows, you know, you'll never get to the bottom of it. You know, no matter how long you're in it, you'll never get to the bottom. And that, that was always really attractive to me. So the, the jobs you've talked about, I mean, you're a race planner for uh, Joseph O'Brien. You do your final furlong podcast. You're a pundit for uh, ITV and Sky. How, I mean, you're so busy. How do you find time to dedicate yourself properly to each of those aspects? Um, uh, you know, I, I just work from the morning to the to night. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because at the end of the day, if you're enjoying it, it doesn't really seem like work. You know, if, if you're in a position, if you're lucky enough to be in a position where you can jump out of bed in the morning full of enthusiasm for what you're going to be doing. And, you know, I'm quite happy keeping working till 9 or 10 at night if, if I need to. You know, it's not, I don't feel it's a burden. So that kind of makes it a bit easy. But, I like, it probably sounds like, when you list it off like that, it probably sounds like a lot of work. But, um, you know, I, I structure it in a way that I still have plenty of time to do it properly. You know, I'd always kind of be I'd like to put the emphasis on quality over quantity, you know, and I wouldn't, I'd be very conscious of taking on too much. So while it might sound like a lot in my mind, it's, it's fine, you know. And one of the things we didn't mention, you're also a, a talented writer nominated for a HWPA award recently. Um, and then one of the things you like to write about controversial subjects, these controversial to racing people. Now, you've, um, a couple that I read, you've got uh, talking about the whip. I was very interested you mentioned the breeding aspect where horses are bred to for an enhanced flight mode, you know, flight mm. sort of reaction. And I was very interested, I'd not heard about that. Can you go into that a bit more and explain what your reasonings for the whip are? Sure, it's just the very nature of racing. You know, you think back to where we started, you know, 300 years ago with these mixed, mixed breed horses that would become the thoroughbred. You know, they're being selectively bred for which ones will, will race the best over a distance. You know, and coming with racing, you know, they have to have a very enhanced flight response. They have to go as quick as they can when you want them to go as quick as they can. And they have to respond well to certain things. And, you know, 300 years down the line, whatever it is, 30 generations of horses, maybe more, you know, we're left with what we have now. And it's, it's a very, very 
efficient machine for the job the right for the for the, for the job thoroughbred does and part of that you know we've been trying for so long to to produce horses that relax when we want them to relax and then run as hard as they can when we, when we want them to run as hard as they can and you know the whip has been an important part of that training process because we've you know these horses from when they're very young they're trained to respect and respond to the whip and that's the way we condition them um, and you know that that's an interesting side of the argument with when people put forward well maybe the whip should only be used for corrective means rather than encouragement but I would just be very very wary of what would the an unintended consequence of that might be um, in countries where they've got rid of the whip altogether it's there has been unintended consequences you know it's begun to favor horses that are that are overly generous on the bridle that don't need a huge amount of encouragement to run as hard as they can and that's not necessarily what we want to be doing you know, in terms of curating the breed, you know, we want horses that relax and then quicken when we want them to. And if we need to use the stick to be the trigger to tell them that we want maximum effort, you know, I think that's 100% appropriate. You know, we we know the whip doesn't hurt horses. You know, there's no science that contradicts that. You know, the RSP, RSPCA are on board with that and we shouldn't be afraid of it. I know it might not look nice um, to an uninformed viewer, but I think we have a responsibility as an industry to explain. And I know that I think Ronald Regan might have said, you know, if you're explaining, you're losing. But I think we owe it to the breed and to the sport to at least try. And I don't think we're trying hard enough at the minute to get that across. Do you think the BHA is looking more appeasement than education? Is that an issue? That would be my view, you know, and I don't doubt the I don't doubt the motivation of the BHA and what they're doing. I think they, like everyone else, want the best for the sport, but I think they're being a little bit too weak in how they approach these issues. I think they do, you know, British racing in particular, you know, they're, they're world leaders in horse welfare and racing. You know, they should be proud of that. They should be standing up with their chest out and standing up to the uninformed, largely uninformed, many of them well-meaning, but albeit uninformed, and, and just say, look, this is what we do. This is why we do it. You know, this is what the whip is. You know, I've been saying it for many years, you know, I don't understand why when we walk into any race course in Britain or Ireland, there isn't a small stand there with a whip, with whips available for the race course to go in, pick it up, do what everyone does when they pick up a whip, see, see, what, see, see for themselves what it's all about. And, you know, yet there's not many people I think would come away from that stand with, with concerns of note. And ultimately, like, I think I did a poll on Twitter there a few years ago in the middle of all the whip debate asking, you know, my following, which would be a very racing focused following, um, had they ever picked up a whip themselves, a racing whip? And I think something like 75% said no. You know, for me, that indicates a gross failure uh, from the regulators and those that promote the sport. Because if a really focused racing audience hasn't been able to pick a whip up for themselves and see, you know, that, that's a failure. Because ultimately, people in racing, I think, want to be on board with all this. But unless they, they've seen it for themselves, they it, you know, it's difficult to, to really vouch for something if you don't really know. If you think you know is one thing, but if you know, you know. And if we could do a better job at educating even our own audience, you know, that would create, you know, tens of thousands of committed ambassadors for the whip. So that when they're around their dinner table with their non-racing family, and one of them says, oh God, I don't like when they whip horses. You know, that person that has been able to hold the whip and see it for themselves, they can stand up and with confidence say, well, actually, and explain, you know, and that's, that's that's the least we owe the sport, that's the least we owe the breed, I think, in terms of going forward and getting, you know, getting the message across that we need to. Okay, and that, another thing I read that you wrote, you, once again about the BHA perception, um, you don't think the emphasis should solely be on the Grand National as, a, as, a, as the shop window for racing, is that, is that, I get that right? Well, look, it's something we can't control. You know, if you were designing racing from scratch, would you make your most, your most risk-filled race your most high profile? Of course you wouldn't. But that's where we are, that's not going to change. And, you know, all we can do is our best. You know, the Grand National had a wonderful run up until this year. You know, it was sadly inevitable that that run would come to an end, but it's all about response and education. You know, and you would be fearful as to what the consequences would be of a particularly uh, tough Grand National in terms of outcomes with, with fatalities and injuries and a, a, vi a, a poor visual spectacle. But. You know, that's, that's why so many people in racing, I suppose, watch the Grand National from behind their sofas. But at the end of the day, I, I think the BHA and Aintree 
can be very proud of what they've done with the Grand National in terms of reducing avoidable risk. You know, just as the same it is with, with, with five furlong sprinters, you know, the risk may be less, but it, it will never be zero. So look, all we can do is, uh, as an industry is do our best to reduce that avoidable risk, educate the viewers. And you know, we all get frustrated around the Grand National time with the, with the sensationalism and the, some of the ignorance that gets bandied about in terms of people looking for clicks and attention by speaking out against it. Um, but that goes away. That goes away very quickly. It's the nature of society these days that people will jump on board the issue of the day on social media and make their voices heard, but they don't care. They don't care. 90, I would venture to say 99% of those negative commenters around the Grand National, they don't particularly care about racing. And they'll be gone again in three days. So personally, and some will disagree, I'm sure, I don't think we need to be stressing about that demographic. I think we need to be focused on people that are interested in racing or potentially interested in racing. Um, and at the end of the day, we're a very niche sport and the majority of the population in both Britain and Ireland will never be interested in racing. That's something we need to face up to and stop being so insecure about. That's just the reality of, of sport nowadays. Do you think it's possible that the, the BHA could put money behind, say, maybe trying to make the Derby or the Wokingham or never be handicapped, something that be, race, you know, non-racing people could focus on, maybe sort of lottery-style things around it, or is, of course, it, is that feasible? Of course they could do more, but I think the tradition is such that the, the national will always be the one with the derby maybe second Cheltenham Gold Cup you know I just think that's it's very difficult to change that you, you wouldn't see a change in that I think unless you, you're talking over a very very long period of time but I think we just we, we are where we are and we just have to do our best to make the best of, where, of what we have. One of the things you do that um, is in, in encouraging more interest in, well, from predominantly racing fans is the Final Furlong podcast which has proved to be very successful I mean it's an hour long and it's for you know, it's for people that are really interested. Why do you think that your podcast has become so successful compared to a lot of others that are out there that fall by the wayside? Um, I think it's just a bit more laid back and fun. You know, there's an awful lot of very serious content in racing, and if you want that, you're well catered for it. But um, there's not so much content with a, with a bunch of lads just sitting around having a laugh about it, you know? Like, the, the vibe we aim for is it'd be as if you're sitting down at the pub and hearing three lads bantering away about racing. You know, there's serious stuff, of course, in the mix of it, but I think a laid back tone is important. You know, I listen to a lot of podcasts anyway, and, you know, the ones I listen to tend to be that, that sort of vibe as well. You know, that's what I think engages people. And I think in particular what we see is, you know, younger people. Of course, we get all demographics, but an awful lot of young people listen to it. And that's a great thing as well, because if we can get young people, you know, college age, younger even, if we can get them engaged and enjoying it, Sure, look, that's, it's, it's serving a great purpose then, but um, yeah, sure, look, I suppose we started off a bit earlier than most as well, so uh, hang around long enough, people pay attention. <laughs>